Well, in the 1970s, I was pastor of a church in Washington, D.C. called Old St. Mary's. As a, it once was a German-speaking uh, parish. But at the time I was there, it was very, very poor. And my nearest neighbors, you know, bought up houses and things. Uh, but I left it there. And I worked with the poor and opened a soup kitchen. And the, the sisters had, once that school had left, it had once been a German orphanage, there's a lot of rooms, so we turned it into a place for homeless women. So I did a lot of work for the poor. So one day, uh, Cardinal Boyle called me and said, uh, you work for the poor, there's a little nun from India I want you to meet, she's coming to Washington. And maybe uh, meeting, she'll, she'll open a convent here. Well, the thing is, she didn't open a convent for several years to come. Uh, but, so I went there on Christmas Eve, I was moving on Christmas Eve in 1970, and she was in the early 70s when I met her at the National Shrine, a special mass for the Catholic Daughters of America. I was a chaplain. And then she said, uh, I'd like to come and see you today, Sunday. Tuesday, I cannot make it. I have to go to Argentina. So anyway, we met. I thought she wasn't going to home. She spent all, all afternoon and late in the evening, even the evening mass on Sunday. Uh, it was charming. And we began just you know, writing back and forth in little notes. Then one day she called me and said, I'll see you on a Wednesday. I said, oh, you're wonderful. You're coming to Washington. She said, no, you're coming to India to give me a retreat. I said, mother, I don't have the money to go to Baltimore. I can't go to India. And she said, oh, you're coming hung up. And I thought, that, my goodness. And I told a friend of mine, a lawyer friend, used to help me with the poor. He said, I'll pay you away. She's a saint. I said, she's a dictator. So I was laughing. Anyway, I went to India. And uh, I, it was a marvelous experience. And she had me give her retreat plus all the sisters to the mother house all at one time. And then after that, uh, actually even before then, I would uh, I met her in New York. She asked me to give a day of prayer. So over the years, I would meet her like in New York several times. And, and I went to Philadelphia another time and uh, different places and even Rome. She had me come and give a retreat there. So uh, going to India was an experience though. The poverty and the suffering was overwhelming. I can remember one day we were in the house for the, for the dying, the lepers, and uh, they brought a poor man in, his elderly, and it was a terrible condition. And she said, uh, just bless him, poor man is dying. So I blessed him. She said, we'll clean him. In other words, you know, towels and wipe him off and everything. I didn't know what to do. And she smiled and she sensed my fear and insecurity. She said, don't fear, Father. She said, if you see with your eyes, you'll only see a leper here. If you see with your heart, you'll see Jesus here. And that tells me what Mother was like. She, uh, she really believed that God possesses us if we surrender to Him through prayer, you know, and discipline of our life. She said, when you pick up a, a crying child or you wash a leper, feeding a poor person, your hands are the hands of Jesus. When you speak, you echo His heart. When you look at someone, you look with His eyes and see what He sees. She really believed that that uh, we become His presence in the world. And that's very, very, very important. We were taught that in the seminary. You know, it was a wonderful experience. But uh, she opened, uh, rather than me uh, encouraging her and directing her in any way, I, th I think she directed me far better than I directed her <laughs> spiritually. But we would uh, frequently meet just one-on-one -on -one and just talk about her own struggles and her own life. Many people make a great... Uh, issue about the darkness that some saints go through. Well, the darkness is, doesn't mean you don't believe. It means that the God momentarily, you, it could be for a lifetime, like for her many years, or just momentarily a day or two. And it seems like God has sort of vanished from your life. I think many of us, we, we call it a night of privation when we experience it. The dark night is what saints talk about. But I said to her, I said, that's a gift from God. Many people say, God, I'll do this. What will you do for me if I do this? But to just say, God, I will do this and ask nothing in return and blindly love you and serve you and ask no sign of presence. I said, that's sanctity. When she was dying, two, I think it was two weeks before she died, I was talking on the telephone with her. And of course, she was in India. And she said, my key to heaven, I love Jesus in the night. Because that's the expression I use with her. I said, to love him in the night is the greatest love of all, Mother. She remembered that. What a lovely soul. But uh, she was a very human person. Like, you know, uh, she, she enjoyed candy. 
People don't realize that. And I remember one time getting off the plane, my second visit to India, and she went like this, oh, you've come, you've come. Did you bring me some candy? And so I'm still laughing. Which she distributed, you know, to the poor too, not for herself. But a very lovely person. She also believed in joy. Many people walk around like a peckle puss, you know, all gloom and doom. Too many people like that today. But we were talking on the a balcony, interior balcony of her mother house, and little sister ran down the stairs, or down, was headed for the stairs that answered the front doorbell. And mother said, come back, sister. Where's your smile? Always smile when you open the door. And I remember that. So when I go to the sick and the dying, I will never walk in like, how are you doing, gloom and doom? I'll walk in and say, how are you doing today now? I bet things are going to be better. You bring them cheer and, and, and not cheer of all the sadness. They don't need that. Um, she also was a, a person that, you know, she looked at people in such a kind way. One time in Washington, I took her to a place, a religious article store, to get a few things. And a woman spat on her, spat on her. And there were people around her was, I guess, horrified. Mother simply took her hand and wiped it off, said, God bless you, God bless you, my child. And that was it. To take her back to that convent I mentioned that to her, you know, I said, Mother, that was, that was you know, shameful. And Mother smiled, she said, no, Father, they spat on Jesus. And, you know, and the way of identifying everything with Christ. With her, she really, she really believed that God walks the earth when he said, uh, I will come again, I will live in you, when he's going to his own death for us. She said, I, I take that seriously, that he lives in us. Uh, she had tremendous love for the Eucharist. I mean, that was the, the key of everything for Mother. And I can remember, I think it was my first or second visit to India, I remember that uh, Mother uh, said to me, oh, thank you, Father. Well, I all had just finished Mass. I hadn't given a talk or a retreat or anything. I said, I haven't done anything. She said, yes, you did. You took bread in your hands and you said, body of Christ, and heaven came on earth and entered me. Imagine, from that day on, when I celebrate Mass, never a single time when I consecrate to the, the host, I look at that and say, you know, this is all heaven with Christ. She changed it for me too. And so, to me, the greatest effect she had in my life was that you look with, with, with love. Like the first day I met, it was at my house, and uh, it was in the afternoon, I guess around four or five, and um, I kept running to the door. She said, why do you keep going to the door? I said, Mother, I make sandwiches and stack them up. The people are always coming here. It's a very poor neighborhood. And what do you give? I said, I, I give them sandwiches. I make pretty good soup, uh, coffee. I said, cookies. There's nothing else to give. She said, do you give them your heart? In other words, was it social action or was it Christ action that possessed you? And that changed my attitude towards things too. That when a poor man would come to the door, I wouldn't say, you know, well, uh, here's some food. I would always say, where are you going for the night? Because there was a shelter nearby and I could write their names and give them my name and, they could, and I could pay for it at the end of the month, their shelter. So she changed my attitude towards. It wasn't just social action, which is wonderful, not telling you to disagreeing, but to see it as Christ's action is far more magnificent. Even the hardest days it motivates you to keep on going with a smile. But uh, she's a lovely, lovely lady and very simple, nothing complicated. She's very tiny. I think she was four feet eight, I believe. One day I was uh, in the, at the mother house and I, and I could hear her coming, uh, talking, laughing, one of the sisters behind me. As she got to me, I shot my arm out. She went right under my arm. I said, London Bridge has fallen down, and she burst out laughing. Oh, she thought that was so funny. Little simple things of life, you know. But uh, in Washington, there was a young man that came back from uh, Vietnam, and he wound up with AIDS. I never even heard of AIDS then. But I'd go to see him in the hospital, and I realized there's nowhere to go for him. So I, had vis I went to New York, I met Mother, and... Uh, we were talking, she had a house of, uh, of, for the AIDS victims there. And I remember this man was walking down the stairs and uh, she told him to come all the way down. And she said, tell Father what you just told me. He said, when my head is burning, I think of Jesus with the crown of thorns. When my body is on fire, I think of him being nailed to the cross. I found Jesus here in this house. Well, that motivated me. So uh, when I met this good man in Washington, 
I went to our Archbishop Hick. He was very wonderful for the poor. And uh, with his permission, we turned one of our buildings, which had been the Catholic Charities uh, building. Uh, and before it was an orphan asylum, a lot, of, a lot of rooms there. And with Mother's agreement that she was his sisters, we opened the, the gift of peace. And I became the chaplain there. And on, on Friday, sort of prepared some of the meals. But it was a wonderful experience. But I can remember one night in particular, a young man dying. And uh, he used to pray the rosary every day and uh, give him communion. He was really dying. And one night he said to me, uh, he was dying that night. He said, I want to say goodbye to my father. So I called him and I said, I apologize for the hour and explained who I was. Well, what do you want? I said, your son is here at Mother Teresa's house. And I said, who I was, the chaplain, I said, he wants to say goodbye. He said, go to hell and hung up. And no, he's not my son, go to hell. And so I went back to the boy and he says, my dad coming. I said, based what mother taught me, I said, uh, uh, is he, uh, uh, is my dad coming? I said, you call me father, could it be your dad for the night? He, he paused a moment and said, I understand father and took my hand. He died two, uh, two hours, three hours later. I then uh, called the next day to that parish, to the pastor whom I knew. Mrs. Sowers on your parish, she said, oh, do you know him? I said, no. I said, but I know someone that knows him. And he said, uh, I said, what's he like? He said, oh, he goes to Mass every day. He's a wonderful Catholic. And I said, he's a fake. He goes to communion, doesn't mean a thing to him. He must leave it at the church doors, the, the Christ. I mean, here's a son dying. Doesn't it, don't it, why didn't he look with his heart, you know, and not just judge, you know, judge things harshly? So Mother was great for having people through prayer and the Eucharist especially and through frequent humble confession and through a discipline of your life to build in you the sense that God is alive in you. She taught me two little prayers I have said for roughly 40 years. At night, the last thing you say is, Good night, dear Lord. If you wake me up tomorrow, wake up in my life. The last thing you say, uh, uh, first thing in the morning, you kiss the, the foot of the cross and you say, good morning, Jesus, come off the earth to me today, and he will do it. And I've seen some really miracles. Uh, I remember one time uh, uh, saying to, uh, to someone in the office, you know, uh, gee, we, we need to buy this and need that. So you don't have any money to order that. And I said, well, Mother Teresa, he said, you know Mother Teresa, Father. And I said, well, I'll ask the dear Lord through Mother Teresa if, if it'll help. But Mother was still alive then. <clears throat> and so... Uh, I remember going to the hospital, and when I came back, he said, some man came to the door and gave me a check. said, this is for Father Curlin's poor, does a lot of work for the poor. And I looked at it, it was $25,000. And I told Mother that, and Mother said, why are you so surprised? Because one night in, in Calcutta, before that ever happened, we were on the balcony, I was waiting for the little pickup truck to take me to the place where I stayed at night. And uh, we were standing there, and I saw people lining up in the street, lying down in the dirt, and they're waiting for, you know, for food for Mother in the morning. It was really desperate. And I said to her, Mother, there's no food in the convent. The sister said, you're out of food here. What will happen tomorrow? And she ignored me. She raised her eyes to heaven and said, uh, Jesus, your children are hungry. Feed them tomorrow. And disappeared. In the morning when I came back, she came to greet me, and suddenly three trucks pulled in from Germany of crates and crates of food. She looked at me as mother and said, are you a doubting Thomas? And, and, and just laughed, you know. <laughs> but the, the whole thing was this. If you really believe, then God can make miracles. God can create miracles for you. Very humble little lady. Uh, I said, the kind, if you didn't know who she was, she, you'd have passed her in the street, wouldn't pay attention to her. Some little nun, you know, not just her, her little size. But a uh, very humble little woman. Uh, she never, you know, I remember saying once when she won the Nobel Prize, she asked them, and give, instead of having a big banquet, could they give the money to her that she could feed the poor rather than some banquet to honor her? Little things like that, you know. She was, uh, you might, I told her once about a movie that um, many Americans fascinated called The Exorcist, being possessed by the devil. And she smiled and she said, Father, why aren't we possessed by Jesus? She said, if you really pray with your heart, miracles come that God wills. And one time, uh, again in India, walking the street one night, a little tiny woman like her, and people rush up and touch her feet, you know, the dust, and put on the forehead. And they would touch mine being with her, you know. 
And she said, it's not you or me, it's Jesus they're trying to reach. They don't even know his name, many of them, and just smiled at that. But I noticed all the poverty, and I said, Mother, these poor people are dying. I said, people say God is cruel. Why would God create leprosy? She said, God didn't create leprosy. God didn't create cancer. God didn't create AIDS or wars or violence or prejudice. She said, mankind created it. She said, God gave us the beginning of creation, a paradise. And we said, no, God, we can do it without you our way. She said, all the sufferings in the world are not God's will. God doesn't will evil or badness or, or, or pain. She said, the world possesses it. Jesus came to put his heart in us, his presence so strong within us, <coughs> excuse me, that she said that uh, we can live in this world with all the evil created by mankind and never succumb to it. We can survive through that and become saints. She said, so don't accept that when people say, shake the fist and say, why is God doing this? If it's bad, God doesn't do bad things. How could good God do create bad? She said, the world creates badness. So well, look at our world today, the violence and the hatred and the killing that poor priest in France and all that. That's not God's will, but it's God's will that, that the evil not conquer us so that it sets inside of us and replaces his love. She said, you know, when someone hurts you deeply, and she was hurt deeply many times by people, and uh, she said, you, you, you don't return hate for hate, frown for frown. Or she said, you look at someone and say, I will give them in place of what they give me, I'll give them God's, God's love, to God's understanding, God's pity. So it was just a simple message because I hear many people say, oh, God, uh, Father, God is so good. Why, why this, why that? And when I tell them what Mother said, it explains it so differently. Uh, and she was a very t a tender woman, you know, very sympathetic to people's feelings, too. Uh, I remember a little boy that was dying, and, and I called her about him dying. And she said, I will pray for, that you have the right words to say him he was dying. And I remember when he was dying, he was sitting in my arms. The doctor had got by the hospital. There's a little side story. And as a Christmas time is coming, and I said, well, now, remember, I said, when you go to sleep, you'll wake up in Christmas land, there'll be Jesus. And he said, oh, well, I'll go to sleep right now. I was, he was seven years old. I said, oh, you'll go to sleep soon. But Gabriel, you'll wake up. You'll be forever happy, son. Don't you worry now. I'm not going to put you down. I kept on, he died in my arms. And I told that to mother. And Mother said, that was God's gift. God gave you the words. It wasn't your words. Those were God's words on your lips. And she said, thank God that he, he had just the right words to say to that dying child. And she said, and he is in Christmas land, isn't he? You know, little things like that. <coughs> it was, you know, she was so sensitive to people's feelings. You know, like when uh, I remember... One of the sisters was carrying something, and mother's white sister, white sister, and she ran over and, t and took it in her arms, and it was something heavy, and carried it for the sister. And later on, I happened to mention it to her, not to embarrass her, and she said, oh, uh, sister has not been well lately. You have to, father, tenderness of the heart is so important. And so for her mother was like that. She was always very sympathetic, very kind. She was not a pushover. You know, the people would take advantage of it. I, I was told that, uh, I think it was in Washington, that a very wealthy man gave her a check for the poor, and she looked very sad. He said, what's wrong? She said, I thought you'd give me more. You gave her a bigger check then. When I asked her about that, when I heard the story, she, she smiled. She said, oh, they shouldn't have told you that. She said, but Father, she said, it bought much food for the poor, much food for the poor. She was something. Uh, her simplicity, it was nothing complicated about the woman. And she wasn't one to pontificate. She was one to live, uh, what Jesus said. What is it? Love your neighbors yourself. You know, to look at someone and say, I, I, the way I speak to you, the way I look at you, the way I, I treat you is the way I, I would have you treat me. You know, but sometimes we, take it, we, we ignore each other. Or we look at each other and just pass by. And she taught me that. So even at days and I'm in the gracious doors, and I catch someone's eye in an aisle or something, I smile at them and say, good morning. Maybe they're startled by it. Sometimes they'll say, oh, good morning, Reverend, or good morning, Father. Sometimes they'll just look at you. No one probably ever said good morning to them or good evening or something. So I make that always a policy that what she mother taught me by the hospitals, on the street or in the stores, I always try to smile at someone. She said, 
uh, it's a simple act of love, but it can magnify itself in that person's heart. And so uh, I think in my own life, you know, I'll be 60 years a priest next year, and God willing. And I think of all these years, the, the things I, 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 I've seen, and I realize now the people I met and the things I've experienced, uh, they, were, they were the presence of God in my life. You get out of the seminary, you know, you don't see that right off the bat. But you have to learn these things. But I can remember an old priest saying to me when I was first ordained, he said, remember, you're ordained to bring God's love to the world. Make love, they'll follow you to heaven. Without that love, they won't cross the street to say hello to you. I told that to Mother one day, and Mother said, Father is, is right, Father was right in those words. She said, love can change the world. Love could end wars. Love could find a cure for so many things that break people's hearts. She said, love of Jesus and, and living the life of Jesus in your life. She said, that's the secret. That's where happiness is found. She said, if you don't have happiness inside of you in your heart, you'll never find it outside of you. So I had a loved one that for oh, almost 70 years just went looking for happiness in the world. And I told him about mother's expression, everything. And I sent a priest to see him, that it was another state. And he called me and said, it's right, what mother taught you is right. I see it now, Bill. She, he said, you look for happiness outside of you. You won't find it unless it's first in your heart. And so the, I think that was a secret of mother's, is the bliss of her life. She had such a deep love of Christ, it was like, it just filled her life. The way she'd look at you, the way she'd pick somebody's burden off their arms, the way she would wash a leper with such tenderness. I'm told that uh, by one of the sisters, that when they first opened the house for lepers, that uh, uh, it had been, I think, like a pilgrimage hall uh, for, their, for their monastery or some pilgrimage place. And they're very angry, thinking she's taking dying people and baptizing them, you know. So they went there to kill her, pick up stones and drag her out. And the priest went in to find her, and he saw her washing a leper with great tenderness and love and kindness. He stood there watching, mesmerized by this, so he told the story later on. I think Malcolm Mugridge repeats this in one of his books. And uh, then he came out and said to them what he saw, and he said, and if you have that kind of love in you that I saw in there, then we'll stone her. He said, but he said, I saw in there the, the love, this magnificent love. And so they never touched him that day on. And but I noticed when I was with her, again, I repeat, the people run up, just touch her, her feet. If she was on in the car, they, they put her hand against the window. So she put her hand against the window. It wasn't they idolized her, but I think, at least I saw it myself, you felt you were in God's presence when you were with her. You felt suddenly the presence of Jesus in a very simple but profound way. I know when she came, when I came to Bishop of Charlotte in 94, she called me and, and, and uh, said, I'm going to uh, bring you my sisters. Well, shortly after, another sister called her mother's too ill, she won't call. She was dead in two years. And uh, mother called back and said, do not listen, I am coming. And she said, you're my spiritual father, but you're also my spiritual son and laughed. Well, she brought her sisters here. And uh, I noticed when she walked in, but at that time was the uh, a Colosseum they used. The place was filled with thousands and thousands of people. And like a hush came over them, you know, just looking at her. At the end of it, uh, one of the police said to her, be careful, Mother, we'll bet you in your car for safety. And, and I saw the people in stretchers, and one particular woman looked at them in agony. I walked over and said, Mother, would you mind blessing this little lady? Mother went to each stretch and blessed them and everything, gave them a little miraculous medal. I later looked, looked for that woman, found her address, and I took two of her sisters to see her. She was dying. She said, I was dying. I felt empty inside. She said, uh, I'm not a Catholic. I die and I fill with God, fill with God. Just that encounter with Mother, that simple, simple way she knew to touch people's hearts. So, uh, I, you know, trained all those years to be a priest and all the years you spend as a priest and all that. But um, she showed me and taught me uh, in a very beautiful way by her action and by her, her the way she lived, that um, the, the real presence of being a Christian is not just going to church and maybe blessing yourself. 
the real action of Christ is that you believe that God in the morning says, wake up now, I want to walk the earth in you today. And uh, say, I, I, will, I will permit this. I will let you live in me today. She said, there's your happiness. And that's what I found with Mother. She taught me that happiness is always with you if it's in your heart. You'll never lose it. Mother entered the uh, uh, Sister Loretto, an Irish uh, sisters that sent pilgrims to, you know, uh, sisters to India. And Mother wanted to go and work there. So I think Mother was 18 when she left home to go to Ireland and become a Sister Loretto. And of course, later went to India. But uh, the, uh, the communist government not to let her come back to see her mother or sister. She was, you know, verboten. She was on the list of, you know, men I entered this country. And that was a heartache. Her sister and mother died and everything. But uh, again, one of the sisters told me that she was with mother. And she said, when finding the Nobel Prize and everything else, and a new, a new uh, administration. And they welcomed mother back you know, very graciously. And she went to the uh, cemetery to visit her mother and sister's grave to say a prayer. And of course, her father died before she went to a convent. And uh, on the way in, they had the brass band and flowers. It was a dictator's grave there. So mother took the flowers, put them on his grave, and said a prayer for him. And that night at this reception in Mother's honor, she met the dictator's wife, you know, a very stern looking woman. And Mother walked up to her and said, I visited your, your husband's grave and prayed for him. God bless him. God rest him. The woman's just dumbfounded, didn't know what to say to Mother. You know, after all those years, uh, such love, such, such sympathy and kindness, little ways of kindness is there. So uh, again, you know, it wasn't, uh, her life was not showmanship. Anything like that. It was so simple, you know. You you would have passed her by in the street if you didn't know her. Hey, there's Mother Teresa, you know. But to, to her, it was just to get up in the morning and believe that God walks the earth in you, and 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 look for the opportunities to bring His presence to others, whether it's hunger to feed them food, or whether it's medicine for the sick, or whether it's just holding someone in your arms who's frightened and of of of, of your death or what it may be facing them. I teased her one time and said, you might be a canonized saint someday. She said, oh, I hope not. She said, no, no, I don't want to be a canonized. I want to live like Jesus. I don't want to be noticed. She was very humble, and she meant it too. But I think it, it awakens in people the sense of a woman who is totally possessed by God's love and uh, to try it themselves, to realize that if this little tiny woman, you know, uh, could do so much and millions of lives she touched and helped, why couldn't they do something for their loved ones? I think that's the greatest thing about our organization. It reawakens in the world. It was so filled with, with anger and fear and death and so much problems. Suddenly, it's like we suddenly wake up and realize, but there was a person here like us, a simple person, who was so filled with love that she transformed millions of lives. And maybe I, I shouldn't give up hope. Maybe if I find the secret of happiness that she found with Christ, I can change to make this a better world. I think she's a, like a spark, you know, enlightening her hearts with a deeper love today. The sisters called and said, Mother died and Mother would want you here. I had hurt my, my back at the time and I couldn't travel too well. And then they called and said, well, Mother would want you here. And then I got a call from the White House that uh, would I be a guest, you know, of, of, of the government, so naturally I said, so, so I went to her funeral. And there was only two American bishops there. One was the former uh, head of the uh, Bishops Conference in the United States, and he represented the bishops, but I'm just, you know, a personal. And, but sisters are so kind to me, they had me right near the coffin, everything was good. And some other house of burial was right there too. Uh, but I noticed how uh, they had, uh, there was a refectory, they cut it in half, like a, a, a wall, like a, almost like a, a chain bridge, and they had buried her there. And nothing but simple, you know, her name on it. You know, I've loved one of us, I've loved you, the words of Jesus. But people come in there all day through the side door. And amid the Hindus, we will put a flowers, a little bit of oil, a touch that stone that covers her grave. People idolize her as a very holy woman. So again, I think... We need someone like her to inspire us. When I hear people say all sides, oh, what a terrible world we're in. Look at all this horror we're going through and all these killings and murders. And uh, it's like we're giving up, you know. And then suddenly 
suddenly everything brightens up. The focus is not only it's on this little tiny nun who changed millions of lives just with the power of God's love in her. So I think, you know, this is the, the secret of her canonization. She wakes us up to the presence of God in us so that we can never give up. We're possessed by him like she was. And in our own little ways, we can bring his presence to, to everyone we touch in this world. I remember a little, a little girl, she said, Lourdes, and I was on the president of the chapel of the Night of Malta when my health permitted, I went every year with our, our pilgrims and the Malads, the people who were sick. And there was a little child over there, I guess around six or seven years old, and uh, at the, the uh, sh shrine at Lourdes, this is my first visit there too, um, the poor little thing, you know, she she was, you could tell she was uh, you know, excited, but still a little frightened by all this car and people. So I took her over to the side where they have the taps, and I blessed her with the water and, and had one of the nights out to clean the cup, gave her some water to drink. I said, you, you say the prayer Mother Teresa taught me, little child repeated, Mary Mother Jesus, make me well so I can serve your son. Well, the, the mother called me when she went back, I think it was Baltimore, and said, I took her to the hospital, then what happened? The tomb is gone, it's disappeared to cancer, it's cancer free. I mean, one week's time. So I've, I've seen a lot of little, what to me are miracles of, of her intercession, no doubt about it. To me, you know, I don't look to say, well, you've got to approve miracles to make sure this person is a saint, it's a man or woman. I think her life was a miracle. I mean, what? How could she not be a saint to accomplish what she did in her life? And there are more nuns now in her community than there were when she was alive. Wow. Well, others seem to be dying down in numbers, her increasing. And, and, and asking for more country, asking for the presence of her sisters. Because they're, they're full of, they have sisters here. And I had the privilege of having Mass on Fridays with them. And uh, it's just a joy to be with them. They, they sparkle with joy and such peace, you know and love, no complaints. They spend their whole life just filled with love.